everybody um welcome back to another episode of tales from the tarot patch i'm your host the kike aloha and today we have a very special guest he is a maori but that's not he he's also a bass player for a heavy metal band called alien weaponry and yeah would you want to introduce yourself brother yeah kia ora koutou uh, aloha kako it's uh yeah turanga or two um, yeah, I just post uh, cultural content regarding Māori people, obviously indigenous to Aotearoa and fellow cousins of Kanaka Māori over in Hawaii uh, and, of course, across all of Polynesia. And, uh, yeah, also the bass player for heavy metal band Alien Weaponry, uh, also known for singing in te reo Māori, a.k.a. the Māori language. So yeah. sort of doubling up on the cultural content there. Super sick, bro. I appreciate your time. And, yeah, I was really looking forward yeah. to this conversation. Yeah, me too. Thanks for having me. Automatic. So the first thing I'd like to ask everybody, just to get like a general idea of who they are, is where are you from and how was it growing up? Yes, I'm a place. I'm from a place called Afangarei, which is in the, getting to the north of the North Island of Aotearoa, of New Zealand. Uh, it's a very small little town. Um, well, anyone, of course, living on the islands will know. So maybe not that small. But small compared to some of the grand cities of the world, you know, where you're still out in the middle of nowhere and you can live on the beach. The beach is right out there, you know, uh, and just uh, enjoy that uh, rural life, eh? And uh, yeah, so life was pretty good growing up. Um, was always rooted in maori Both my parents are Māori. Um, and so basically just grew up around it and took my passion a whole step further again once I hit university. And, and um, you know elevated my level of education towards things maori and and polynesian and here we are now all of a sudden uh, it's part of my job which is pretty out the gate <laughs> that's super sick bro so the place you're from is more like rural countryside yeah so new zealand's biggest city is a city called auckland uh, mm. and that is about an two hours away from where i live uh but so when when you leave auckland it starts to just be the rural north uh what we would say like, it's obviously the North Island. It's called the North Island. But there's a little bit of the North Island that people actually call Northland. And I live at the beginning of Northland, which is where it starts to get really rural. And then the further up you go, it becomes, like, nowhere land. Oh, okay. That's sick. So, if, like, we... Is it possible to, like, drive the entirety of New Zealand in a day or no way? Um, no, it takes about... For me to get to Wellington, so Wellington is the bottom of the North Island before you have to cross the the strait. Um, it's about 10 hour drive. It's about a 10 hour drive. So I would say to do top of the North Island to bottom of the North Island, you're probably looking at 15, 15, 16 hours. Oh. Um, so you could do the whole country in a couple days for sure. Well, that would be a fun cross country tour. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite nice. The, the roads are very nice, very scenic, of course, being being New Zealand. Um, there's lots to see, uh, especially in the North Island. Well, the South Island is also very scenic, but the roads there are very straight, so they get a bit harder to drive because it's so just like <laughs> just straight and, and you get a bit sleepy driving on those roads. I bet. So what was like schooling like for you growing up? Did you go to like any... um In Hawaii, we call them Hawaiian Immersion Schools where like... Yeah, obviously, like, it's all conducted in Olalo, Hawaii. But, like, do you yep. guys have that in New Zealand for Maoris? We do, we do. We have Kohanga Reo, which is preschool, uh, immersion, full immersion preschool. And then we have Kura Kopapa, which is full immersion, you know, from the ages of five to to high school. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in my community, when I was that age, we didn't have those um, facilities available to us. You know, mm. Too small of a community, not enough funding, not enough resources for it. So I just went to a normal public school. And um, luckily, our public school provided a, you know, like a once a week oh. Maori teacher that would come in and, and do a yeah. little class. So I would take part in that. But from, from what I remember, it didn't really help me that much. Most of my learning for the language, at least, um, regarding Maori stuff. Uh, came much later in life at university so when i went to university is where i learned most of my um, te reo maori and still am learning it 
Um, but yeah, my parents went to look at the nearest um, Kohangaru when when I was born, but they were like, nah, it was definitely not set up, not not to the caliber that they are today. You know, there's some really yeah. good um, Kohanga available now for young Maori kids growing up, and we're starting to finally see, you know, a, a higher a percentage of young Maori kids who are growing speaking, up speaking yeah. Maori and only Maori, you know, and, and they're actually having to learn English yeah. like as their second language instead <laughs> like their of ancestors normally ancestors did. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly which is actually learning because i would say for the majority of the past 50 years if they were dual speakers they learned it in tandem you know mm, they yeah. learned maori and english but just right at the same time but now we're actually seeing kids that are learning only maori and then when they get to a certain age they have to learn english completely fresh which is real out of it to see yeah that's super cool i feel like uh, um hawaiians could take a lot of things from maoris when it comes to like perpetuating their culture you guys seem to have got it like down to a sense to where like you guys get your government involved <laughs> and yes we do i always consider us pretty lucky uh in the scheme of um you know if we look across polynesia and and, and our polynesian relatives um about the cultural preservation we've been able to maintain i suppose uh but i think there's many factors of course that play into that of course um being at such a distance from our colonial power yeah being britain in this <laughs> context you know where hawaii's not that far away from the united states yeah, you know yeah. so like their power and influence as a colonial power is so strong and can be so strong where britain to new zealand is a is that a very big distance yeah. and a big disconnect and so i think it's been easier for us of course also pop populous and population landmass you know obviously aotearoa is the biggest of the polynesian islands uh, by a landslide and so i think we've had the opportunity that when colonial powers uh, were introduced to the country that you know because there was space for everybody to exist it hindered i won't say it didn't happen but it's it halted the uh, colonial oppression that that you will see like, if you go to Samoa and the yeah, small islands. Yeah. Imagine when missionaries turned up and there wasn't that much to <laughs> nowhere to, be go. Able to nowhere to go, basically, right? So there's there's many factors that play into it, but we definitely have maintained a pretty strong cultural revolution, I suppose, no, against definitely. the the uh, oppression attempts by um well, at this point, I won't even say Britain, the New Zealand government, you know, at this yeah, point. Yeah, because it's so separated it's from entity. the town. Right? It's so yeah. separate now. You know, it's really the New Zealand European government. Bro, now. I think it's so crazy how, like, Maoris literally had the New Zealand war and, like, there's battles that you guys mopped, like, the Redcoats, bro. Like, Yes, yes. And that's one thing, too, is we had, for whatever reason, I, I wouldn't actually know why this developed this way, but... We did develop exceptional um, Rifle warfare too. tactics, yeah. you know, general warfare tactics, defensive tactics, which are sort of unrivaled across when you when you look across Polynesia. For some reason, Māori developed these warfare tactics that were unseen. Everywhere well, else. Think you guys were, were fighting against to... each other, so like you guys had to have been like using some yeah. nice tactics because, bro, yeah. Like, even your guy's moko is intimidating, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, you know, that's one of those things, too. It's like, you know, we developed, a, a, obviously, Polynesia has tattooing traditions, as we know, uh, but moko developed it, it very different, differently. You know, for some reason, it developed differently in the patterns that we see across Polynesia as Definitely. well, for whatever reason. But I always just put it down to us being so grumpy. Like I was chatting to you earlier, grumpy because it's cold, fighting because it's cold, grumpy because it's cold, you know? Because yeah. I always say we've got the aggressive language as well. You know, when you listen to like Olelo Hawaii, it's so beautiful and flowy. And you listen to Māori and it's, ah, ah, fuck, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> it's just so aggressive, so aggressive. And I'm, <laughs> I was like, why, man? <laughs> Bro, that's so funny you say that, dude. Cause yeah, it threw me off when the when I learned that the WHs make Fs. I'm like, why wouldn't you yes. guys just use Fs? Yes. Well, the tricky thing with that is, of course, is that's not something that we've done. Um, and yeah, as I'm sure, Little yeah, Hawaii yeah, yeah. has the missionaries uh, has, came and kind of like the missionaries what they wrote heard, it, and they, so they wrote it down. They wrote yeah. out, and where they landed, the first places that started to transcribe Te Reo Māori into you know English typeface was one of the dialects. Yeah. Where yeah. It is WH, like they make a huh sound, you know, yeah. like white or when. Whereas the majority of Māori use F in the same place, but that's not where they first heard. They first heard huh. 
Um, yeah. So like where I live, where I live, Fangare, W H A N G A, Fanga. But to the people of the north, they would say Huanga, right? Yeah. Huangare. Yeah. So that's why they wrote the W H. And then they traveled south, and everyone else was going, "No, it's an F. It's an F." <laughs> and then some places it's like more like an H. So like you'd say Hangare. Mm. And then some places it's really W, like without the H. It's just W, like oh, W. Oh, okay, so okay, okay. Then Wangare, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, like the, the common is f, but so that's just a doubt of the missionaries miswriting it. Yeah. And then I guess they were like, well, I guess WH covers w, qu, h, and I guess it can cover an f, I suppose. That's <laughs> fine. We'll just keep it. <laughs> that's classic. So, could you take us um a little through your journey as to how you ended up with alien weaponry as a bass player? Yeah. So, uh, Henry and Lewis are the two brothers um, that founded Alien Weaponry as a band, and I went to high school with them. So oh, okay. me and Henry particularly, uh, me and Henry were in bands in high school that like weren't Alien Weaponry, you know, just for fun. Oh, okay, um, the garage kind. Yeah, 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 talent you know, just show. to play at school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. talent show bands. Um, so me and Henry were in bands there, but then I went, uh, obviously separate ways to do university. I went to university and all that after school, uh, and they were doing the band. And so when their old bass player, Ethan decided he was going to move on, you know, part ways, they were just thinking, oh, who do we know that's a musician? And who do we know that's Maori and a musician? And then again, cause it's even rarer again, who do we know that's Maori a musician and into heavy metal specifically? <laughs> cause I'm sure it's probably the case over there as well, but Polynesians and heavy metal aren't normally, it's not normally the vibe, you know, they're normally reggae, no. hip hop type, See, type jams, Islander you know? vibe, uh, the Island giant. music, right? Yeah, bro. Um, okay. And that's the same here, you know, reggae is a huge thing in Maori communities here. And so heavy metal Maori musician is, it's a rare little tidbit. So yeah. they said, oh, two, who's that? Of course. He's heavy metal music in Māori. And so they asked me and they asked a couple other guys, but no one else was actually Māori because, again, hard to find them who like heavy metal. Yeah. Um, so the other guys we were auditioning against were just metalheads and musicians. They were like Catch a Fire, um, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. They do. Now, I love um, Catch a Fire too. No disrespect. Same, same. Yeah, I've seen too. them live like four times in my life already. And each time, like, I just love, like, I don't know. I feel like the English accent that Maoris have versus like the American pigeon accent Hawaiians have. Is yes, yes, yes. So much more like elegantly sounding, you know? <laughs> oh, oh, it's funny. Yeah, yeah. They're very different. Hey, eh? they're very different. It's the first thing. I don't know why I didn't. Um, I'd never heard of it before until I. Well, my girlfriend doesn't speak with that. She speaks with more of an, an I would say, a normal American accent. Mm. Um, but she was telling me about because, of course, born and raised in Hawaii, and she was like. Oh, you know, they, the, you should hear the, the like, the, the pigeon accent. Yeah. And I was like, what do you mean? I was like, does it sound like other islanders? She was like, no, it doesn't. You should check it out. I was like, whoa, pretty yeah. out of it. So, like, I feel like there's a chunk in the middle where islanders sound like uh, like the islanders. Yeah. And then there's Hawaiian pigeon. And yeah, and then there's Maori English, which is, like, a different English. Yeah. Again. It's like there's, yeah. The ones on the outside have got, like, these uh, quite out of it sounding yeah. accents. Those and then there's, little, like, a bunch in the middle. It's like a little twang for the dialect yeah 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 so no and so um after all that they were just like yeah two's the one and and here i am and i've been doing that now for yeah two years two and a half years or something sick, yeah, bro. maybe nearly three years so it's basically like you're just jamming with like people you grew up with <laughs> yeah pretty much pretty much yeah i've known those boys since i was uh 11 years old yeah. i think about, about high school so um oh that's super just, cool uh, bro a natural progression of things yeah solid so are there any other instruments you can play besides bass? Yeah, so bass actually is my most recent instrument. I'd never played bass before oh. they asked me to audition. Uh, I'm a guitar player, obviously, okay. by all the, <laughs> all the bloody guitars. And so, but, you know, it's it's interchangeable skills with the bass. Um, but my first instrument was piano. So I learned piano first. I picked up guitar, uh, piano when I was six. I picked up the guitar when I was about 11. Then my brother was a drummer, so he taught me how to play drums uh, earlier in my teenagehood as well. Mm. Um, and then yeah, I tried to fiddle around with a couple weird instruments in the middle, but I, and it never really stuck. And then, yeah, when the band hit me up, I picked up the bass and oh. figured out how to learn, learn to play bass. What were those weird instruments? Ukulele. Like... <laughs> <laughs> oh well of course we grew up with that as well you know my, my dad my dad has a few um and so i did learn to play that as well i actually learned to play that before i learned to play guitar um 
and but like violin and chromatic oh. harmonicas you know like the harmonica that stevie wonder would play not yeah. like a blues harmonica no, violin like all is these sick. Like, yeah and saxophone as well i tried um but uh I, they haven't stuck they haven't stuck because they were hard <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of work <laughs> So Alien Weaponry is famous for incorporating Te Reo Māori um, into their music. How important is it for you guys as a band to infuse that cultural heritage into your guys' art? Yeah, so one thing that's really, um, well, of course, the the bands uh, started doing that well before I was a part of it, you know, but it was one of the reasons that I resonated with joining the band when they asked me, you know, it wasn't just a band that I knew or a band that I used to be friends with members of, you know, it was like specifically they are, you know, pushing the cultural revitalization yeah. and the language revitalization, which is something that I found important and significant enough that that's what resonated with me to actually join uh, or audition at least. Um, and because it's very important because, you know, here in Aotearoa, even though we were talking before, we have done a good job of cultural preservation as Māori. There is still a lot of hostility and negative feelings as as is the natural uh, way of things when it comes to people who are Oppressed. considered... Yeah, yeah, you know, so the current New Zealand European climate and, and, and uh, opinions towards things Māori is still definitely negative. It's getting better. Um, but there's still a lot of racism, prejudice, and all that sort yeah. of stuff that goes on, and just general hate towards things Maori. Yeah, and so I we heard, think it's I really important Maoris, that they get like, um, like even if they get caught like doing the pettiest little crime, their freaking sentences is like so much more, um, I guess like critical than non Maori. Yes, we see that all over the world, really. You know, minorities get unfair treatment in the justice systems around the but world. And but that's your guys' Maori's home, no though, you know? Yeah, like, it's that's... pretty crazy, right? It's pretty crazy. It definitely happens, you know, and I've, we've seen it happen in my own family and that sort of thing where two people who basically do the same crime get very different, you know, they get very different sentences mm -hmm. depending on their heritage or their yeah. ethnic groups. Um, yeah, and so when I uh, when the... Um, what's really important for the band is that because we sing it across all over the world, yeah. you know, it proves to people back home that people like it, you know, people <laughs> enjoy it, people want to hear the language being sung and spoken in international settings, so why the hell can't we do it in our own homeland, you know? Because Ew. that's what we're fighting for, is, is for our own people to do it. That's so true, bro. You guys are internationally recognized, as we said before. Um, what is one of the most memorable places that you guys performed in, and why? Easily Spain, um, because Spain, the one thing we'll never forget was, yeah, we played Resurrection Festival last year, I think, uh, sort of like late last year, and it was you know, like a crowd of 15,000 or whatever, and they were all singing in Māori, you know, which is just a crazy, it's a crazy thing. Like, so, because of course we play all those festivals, but not everybody knows who we yeah, are. Right? Yeah. So to have a good chunk of the crowd actually know who we are and know who we are enough to sing the lyrics with us. And this is in a place where they don't necessarily speak English. No, you know exactly. I mean? like, That's they're speaking across Spanish. the world. Yeah, and they're speaking or singing Māori, you know, <laughs> singing Māori to us in the crowd. And, like, it was so crazy. We still talk about this as a band. Like, this is our collective opinion as of recent, one of the more um, memorable shows we played. You know, we, we, we wear those in-air monitors on, on stage. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and we were, like, playing, and we were, like, sort of, like, damn, is that what I think it is? And so we all, all of us, like, popped our, our thing out so we could hear the crowd, and, yeah, the crowd is there. It was, like, the rain was pouring and the sun had set and everyone was singing in Māori. We were like, yo, this is crazy, man. Oh, that so that was definitely a uh, pretty, pretty special moment. Yeah, that sounds like it, bro. Oh, especially halfway across the world, and they're singing in your tongue, you know what I mean? Like... That's what I mean. It was crazy. You know, we dream of getting that here in our own country. <laughs> uh, not even necessarily that scale, right? But if you had 200 people, whatever the venue size is, if they felt confident enough to sing in Te Reo Māori, that's like the key. And here, you could have 10 people that don't want to sing in Māori because of whatever reason. Even if they're fans, maybe they're self-conscious, they don't want to mess it up, but you know, all these things. Uh, we're over there, they're just like, bro, we just love the songs, woohoo! Yeah, yeah. Just, just think about it, you know? And so it's like, we want to bring that, show people that that's okay, you know? 
I feel like a lot of the times when people like are self conscious and stuff about like how they sound, they're not really trying. Cause like, think of it from a kid's perspective. Like, they aren't shame when they're learning how to speak English. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's they make right. Mistakes I, I, all the time, but like as an adult, you're so like um hyper focused on every little like mistake you could make that you don't even want to try. Yes, exactly. You know, people get too too worked up about it, and then of course, because unfortunately, you will see, um, you know, every now and then you'll have someone in this case, Maori, you know, who will put the person who's learning down. You know, they'll they'll make fun yeah. of them. Oh, you messed up. You you didn't say that correctly. I'm like, hold up, man. They're still learning. You know, yeah. You don't want to do that because then what that does is it scares them off. Yeah. You know, they get scared and they don't want to learn. They're not going to try anymore. I'm like, you got to be nicer, man. You know. I'm like, hell, if I had started learning basketball, there's no way I'm going to be able to shoot three pointers <laughs> on the first day. Or dunk, you know? let alone, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, you got to take practice. You got to take <laughs> practice. But people get very fussy when it comes to language. I think, particularly, of course, languages that are in a, a potentially endangered state, you yeah. know, like these, these indigenous languages are, because no one really complains about people learning English, whether they mess up English. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah. People are just like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's just English, you know. We know what you're saying. Yeah. But when it comes to these endangered languages, people all of a sudden get Grammar very... police. Like, no, Grammar you didn't put about an Okina it. right over here. Yeah, 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 you know. And I'm like, mm, you got to be careful with that stuff, you know, because it's like you don't want to scare people off. We're trying yeah. to keep a language alive here, you know what I mean? And to keep it alive, you've got to actually have people speaking it. Yeah, seriously. That's um actually one of the ideology slash methods my recent kumu used in teaching olelo hawaii so last semester i failed olelo hawaii 301 and it literally like totally ruined my whole entire like confidence like i was like thinking i was gonna have to drop out of school because i yeah. needed that to graduate but then i ended up finding a new teacher over the summer and he totally like revitalized my whole entire like motivation to want to learn the language and he made a really good point. Like, as a Hawaiian, it's your kuleana, bro. Like, how how can you, like, not want to learn your mother tongue? Like, yeah. Even, it, it's like, one of those things as simple eh? as, like, being able to, like, read old Hawaiian newspapers and know what the hell they're talking about, you know? Like, yes, you're not going to be able to unless you do the work and learn the language. So, yeah, I ended up acing it in the summer. So, freaking stoked. Back on track. Here we go. Yeah, no, the teachers can make all the difference, you know. Like I said, I, I was learning all my childhood, but none of it ever really stuck, you know. Yeah. Like whatever they were teaching wasn't it. And then once I went to university, though, I learned the most I'd ever learned in my life in the span Shortest, of two years, yeah. you know. You go, damn, the teacher makes all the difference. Bro, you know? that's what I Unfortunately, told... I had to move out, and I've kind of lost a little bit, so I try to use the content and that to keep, keep up what I have, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. You got to use it or you lose it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You find that out real quick. But Once that's... upon a time, you're like, yo, man, I can say whatever the hell I want. <laughs> and and then all of it, you don't do it for six months. And you're like, what the hell was that word again? <laughs> yeah. And like, man, it's gone. And it goes. Seriously. Bro, that's the same thing I um basically told my, my new Kumu. I was like, I feel like I learned more with you in this first week of class than I did like the whole last semester. Yeah. Bro. Yeah, which could be frustrating, you know, because you go, oh, why right, was that? You now, where were you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, where were cheap. you 10 years ago, man? I'd be speaking it by now if I had yeah. you when I was a kid, you know? Serious. Or, bro, as a kid, I was like, I wasn't into my culture as a kid. And that's what's so, like, irritating. Like, looking back at it now, like, growing up, like, I can't be mad at anybody for, like, not pushing it on me. But it's like, yes. Bro, like now that i'm proud of my heritage and my culture and stuff like i don't know i feel like a lot of islanders grow up with a weird sense of identity because they're like shamed of their islander self but like bro, yes. we gotta be embracing that shit like yes if you look at it from like the grand scope of things like we're kind of like endangered species bro and like we are absolutely <laughs> we gotta perpetuate <laughs> you know and that's what i think is important too about the um interconnection that we need to develop i talk a lot on my page about how lots of maori don't even realize we are polynesian or they don't like to yeah, call ourselves yeah, polynesian, they, you know? they and it's one of the them. things i yeah they've disconnected from the two things now of course there's lots of reasons why but i think that also is to the disbenefit of us because once upon a time during the early polynesian kingdom as i like to call it the maui 
period of the world yeah. um, before we'd all split off and become, you know, Hawaiians, yeah. Samoa, and you know, before we were we individuals, were when we were just still. we were just one big Polynesian kingdom, um, all rotating around the mini Hawaii. Um, and like that is such a significant part of who we are, you know. And I was like, if we brought ourselves back together enough, enough, obviously we definitely are our own peoples now, you know. There's yeah. nothing we can do to change that. But if we start to relate ourselves again to we, to one another, you know, the the survival and the revival, I think, can just be like ramped up a million, you know, because we don't have to be worrying about it ourselves, you know. It makes all islanders proud to be all a part of the same family, you know. Yeah, most definitely. And I feel like um a lot of the time people fail to realize that like most polynesian cultures never have written language and like when they had their first contact with i guess foreigners bro like so much of the populations got decimated by like sicknesses and diseases that they had no defenses for and you got to yes. realize like with that loss of life that was also like a huge loss of information and knowledge because like yes it's not like it was orally passed down yet so it's like even learning stuff through university now, like, it's kind of through, like, one lens. And it's like, there yes. wasn't just one aspect of being Hawaiian. It's kind yes. of, it's like super elite centrified in the, in the university system. And I'm like, yes, that wasn't the only, like, systems. You guys got to, like, teach everything, not just, like, yeah, that's kind of also another, like, colonist mindset thing. But it is, it is it's the sort of trying to, create one perspective yeah. to you know impart upon people where it's like but that's ne like you said we were oral people uh oral tradition people and the oral traditions also had to come from they didn't come from one person you know they came from yeah. multiple people yeah. and all the knowledge was shared and spread by multiple people to create multiple versions and variations and you know like when we think about our creation stories even you know um yeah. there's not one creation story you know, there's yeah, many. a whole range of creation stories and they're all like right. the valid creation yeah, story. Yeah, you know? yeah. Agreed upon. Was, yeah, they're all agreed upon. Well, not necessarily agreed, of course. Some some tribes will still be like, no, my one's <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. the point being is that they all existed in unison, whereas upon the arrival of European writers and settlers that decided to they would try and take them and turn it into one yeah, story. And then yeah. that one story is the creation story. And you go, no, you lose a whole essence about what our people were like. Um, I mean, Maori, but even pre-Maori, you know, yeah, Polynesian, yeah, yeah. early Polynesian, how the whole kingdom was run. Even even with... the term Hawaiian, like people fail to realize like that was only a term after King Kamehameha, like did his whole conquest like before that each island had their own dialect they celebrated yes. their own makahiki at their own different times of the year like this whole we was all hawaiian wasn't they were like kanaka on different like they were oahuans yes. kawaiians big yes. islanders you know it wasn't like all kumbaya around the campfire yeah 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 and and we always try to tell that to people as well you know because obviously the term maori yeah just in use, generally encompasses it just all encompasses and you know maori are made up of like a hundred tribes or something you yeah know? once upon a time that's what you identified with was your the name of your tribe you know so ngati rarua ngati hene whatever that is what you were, you know, you weren't yeah. Māori back then, you were Ngāti Hine yeah. or Ngāti Wai. And then it was European settlers that were like, okay, you're all Māori then, I guess. And we're like, mm, okay. But so then the problem with that is, yeah, every tribe had their own dialect, customs, you know, laws, ways that they governed their people. And that was just how it was. And then the introduction of settlers is what lumped it all together and started to treat us as if we were one thing with one belief and it's one thing that lots of people who who find my content struggle to kind of grasp is when yeah. i say remember the stuff that i tell you is i try Your my hardest perspective and it's my perspective at the end of the day and i try very hard to try and make it as broad as i can you know yeah. i try to answer stuff that's not exactly um iwi specific but it's impossible to do completely so i always yeah. try to be like remember if what you hear from me is not what every single maori uh, ever yeah. is going to say you know and but people are like what do you mean though aren't you maori that isn't that how i was like no <laughs> like you guys can um pretty much trace your guys lineage back to like the the vaka that brought you though right 
Yes, yes, we can. You know, um, it's part of our. We have a concept in Maori dom called pepeha, which is basically your lineage, both physically with your uh, actual human ancestors, but that extends to landmarks that are significant oh, to your yeah. tribes, people, and then of course the waka that took us, that brought us here in the first place. Um, Aina which is, is an like ancestor. List. Yeah, exactly right, and so that normally you'll you'll rattle off your mountain your river or ocean body of water um the waka and then of course your tribes and then your village and then your actual family is normally like the list the list that you will that you'll say and so yeah we, we keep such oral records and now of course we can have written records but um traditionally speaking of course yeah it was an oral record of your lineage that you would recite to people to you know upon meeting them yeah to make connections you know yeah, make yeah. connection like oh yeah i see you're from here or to a sort of oh yeah you're from here and all this and that yeah. um and you can know whether you either well once upon a time whether you're friendly or not you know? yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. these days of course it's more about connection because because maori now are so i mean with maori but also with non-maori you know so into interbred now you know, we got mixed mixed lineage across the board. Um, that that system of pepeha is a way that you can make connections with people, no matter where you travel. You yeah. know, there's always a way. And so, like in my context, for example, there's four tribes I can use to identify myself with um, on the different sides of my family, mum's side and dad's side. And so, depending on the context, right? If I say Ngati Hene, if you're somewhere that is resonates with Ngati Hene. There's no point me saying another tribe. <laughs> yeah. You want to use the one that's Ngati Hene, right? You can say, oh, I'm Ngati Hene. And they go, oh, you know, cool. Welcome, yeah. you know, your family. <laughs> and so you can sort of pick and interchange them to create connections. Cause that's one thing that lots of people lose as well Is it's not about you. Those aren't actually about you. It's not like I'm from here. It's trying to say like, where else could you be from you know like, yeah make it it's a it's a it's a group thing it's about connection it's not just about this is me and i'm from here and you know all about me 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 it's like actually these are where i belong do you also belong can we you know make a make a connection through this and quite often people go oh yeah yeah i know i know oh yeah yeah yeah. so it's become a big part of our identity is that and we're right back to the waka that we used to to navigate here with yeah super sick so speaking of um, voyaging and stuff, did you like? Do you guys have any scary stories while traveling abroad? Like whether it be you lost your passport or freaking. Normally, the pants. worst things that happen are um, it's all just simple stuff, you know. Lots of things are just really frustrating at the end of it, you know. Often you get what we call tour flu, you know, like as soon as you start touring, you get sick. Oh. And you could be sitting at home all year and you're <laughs> never sick all year. And as soon as you hit the aeroplane, you get sick. And it's always the worst sick you've ever been, you know, like yeah. you're sick, <laughs> but you've still got to get up there and play a show and you're like, <laughs> you know, like try not to die. Um, or of course, any sort of food poisoning, you know, oh, there's a couple the of worst. stories where you get the stomach bug, but you're on a bus where buses, the buses will have a toilet, but you're not allowed to like, you know, go number two in the toilet. So if you get like a stomach bug, always bad news, man, it's real bad news. It's so that's always not that friendly. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then also, uh, of course, the worst of them all is losing gear. Like if you lose mm. your musical instruments, you lose your equipment, uh, which happened to us last year. We had one fly date. Now, most of the time you're driving with the trailer, so your gear is with oh, you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but we had one day where we had to actually fly. And so we took half of our gear, you know, in case something went wrong. And yeah, on the flight back, the flight got canceled and the bags got lost. And so we had to play a week of festivals where we had half of our stuff. And that was like, grim that's never fun because it's stuff you're not familiar with stuff that's often just you know spares that people have at yeah. the festivals which means they don't work very well so you get a whole bunch of tech difficulties man it, it's it's pretty grim sometimes but otherwise than that i mean touring life in our experience is pretty straightforward you know you wake up play a show try find something to eat that's normally mcdonald's and then go to bed and then you do that for three months huh? and go home <laughs> Do um does your music ever resonate differently to audiences in different parts of the world? 
It does. It does. So if you find yourself in places like, I mean, hell, let's even take Scotland, right? Like, of course, Scotland oh. can very, very easily be misconstrued just to be a part of the UK, right? But of course, Scotland and Ireland and those sorts of places were all invaded by Britain. Yeah, Britain. You know? yeah. so, so they have the same colonial history to us, even though we can forget that and just lump them in because they look look yeah, like British yeah, people, yeah. right? But they actually share the same colonial history that we do. So when you play places like Scotland, they really do connect to the colonial messages we share, right? Because they, I mean, you tell them, you, you call a Scottish person British and they will absolutely... Oh, yeah. They <laughs> rip, they'll, get, they'll rip into you for that, you know? So even places Welsh. like that, Yep, them too, you know, because they do, and so they do respond differently to actually then playing in, you know, London, like actual yeah. Britain. When you play there, they see it, in my experience, kind of like a novelty, right? Like, they enjoy it because it's sort of like, oh yeah, it's different, you know, there's this cool different cultural stuff, which is fine, you know, yeah. you can enjoy it for that. But you see people resonate with it differently when they are connecting to the message of the music. Yeah. So, so places like Scotland and all those places, and also some places in Scandinavia where anywhere there's indigenous population, right, that has some form of colonial history. So, um, uh, where's the other place? Oh, of course, like, native america right so um we play quite often for the navajo we get invited out to the reservation a lot if we're doing a north american tour um and we play shows for them out there in in um in the desert yeah. and that's always very cool you know and they really feel the messages behind their yeah. music you know the one thing that we're missing and we always talk about it being our dream tour is we love to do a polynesia tour you know um, oh that would be sick because that's what we do of course is talk about polynesian struggle and so one thing we if we ever get famous enough to be able to afford that because that'd be a very difficult difficult tour to do you Plane. know like you guys ever have to navigate on the hokulea <laughs> yeah um so that's a, that's the one place we haven't been able to do that we would like to do you know is is all the islands um we've only been able to play our own country ah uh, but that still must be that still must be fun though yeah, it is. It is. You know, it's nice. It's nice to be able to do that for people and see how people, again, because even though you don't speak in English, people know, you know, people yeah. feel that yeah. the the mana behind it, I suppose. Yeah, um, no, that's definitely and, what and it they, is. And they resonate with it regardless of the language barriers or any of it, you know. If they've got the, the history there, they just... They, they do. They respond in a very different way to places that don't have that history, you know. Yeah. Like, we play in Texas. Texas is great. Texas is one of the funnest places to play. The crowds go crazy, man. They, they, they just go completely wild. But you can tell that they're connecting to the music differently. Yeah. You know? They're not connecting to it because they yeah. resonate with the music. They're just loving the energy yeah. in that, you know. Yeah. But when you play for Navajo, totally different vibe, you know. Super cool. Yeah, that's one thing I was wondering about, um... Yeah, just when you guys go out and play for different crowds. So you spoke about losing your gear. That must suck. But, like, what is some of the other challenges in the music industry that is, like, super tough to overcome? What most people don't realize, I think, is just how little money there is. Like, outright, right? You know what I mean? Like, everyone's always, like, well, particularly here in New Zealand, of course, because as Alien Weaponry, we spend most of our time playing shows out of new zealand right so we have to yeah. travel abroad to play most of our shows and what most people see there is oh wow they're playing overseas you know yeah, they're they've rich. made it big enough yeah. they're rich they're flying out to europe they play in Private europe jets. you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and you're like man you come home and you get like 20 bucks you know what i mean it's like the boys i mean obviously i'm fortunate enough to try and work through social media these days yeah um, but the other members of the band they just work in a cafe one of our singers the, our singer works at a chicken farm you know like we work day jobs and i've just been fortunate enough to make social media my day job um but uh like there's yeah by no means any money and it's always the biggest misconception is people go oh man if you people just think i think if you play a show and you play a big show you may keep some money yeah. right and you're like man no there's so many people out there that aren't the musician that want the musician's money yeah. and take the musician's money you know uh, we always sort of joke that 
ultimately we're not a band we're a traveling t-shirt shop you know we make our money by selling our band merch, merch. Yeah. so if people don't buy the merch we don't make any money and people think that we make our money from door sales but it's not the case anymore because venues take such a huge cut and you know labels and managers and that sort of thing all take percentages so at the end of it all the band is left with this much so to actually and then that much has got to go towards your actual costs and of course for a band from new zealand we spend a lot of money traveling so yeah. a lot of our budget actually goes into just getting out of the country in the first place you know yeah um you, you're spending tens of thousands of dollars just to fly us out to europe to play a <laughs> month of shows you yeah. know um and so it, it's much rougher and i always tell people like think about that when you're at your show next you know instead of buying 10 beers you know or five glasses of beer buy a t-shirt because the beer just goes to the venue the t-shirt will go to the band you know the people that you're actually there to watch um which is always a, a something that lots of people just don't don't realize dang so on a, well, on a lighter note what is like the greatest milestone you've achieved so far my moko for sure you know getting getting my getting my face done with my mom was just easily the uh, one of the biggest moments of my life to date um both personally significant culturally significant of course um and it ties into everything that i now do you know so it, so it's it's worked out um very well both personally and then on a, on a bigger scale as well so but for me, that's that's definitely where it sits right now. Is um, that'd be tough to beat. You know, it'll be a tough milestone to beat. Obviously, I'll get more done in my life. You know, and and get more of my face done, um, throughout my life. But nothing will beat the very first time. You know, the first session of the face will. The rest of the face won't won't hold that same um, significance. <laughs> so, touching up on Moko. Maori, that's they're famous for their moko. Can you give us like um a better understanding of the practice and why it's so significant for you guys? Yeah, so in short terms, moko basically is um the representation of your whakapapa or your lineage. So whakapapa is the Maori concept of 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 heritage, mm. um, where you come from or who you come from, who you are. Uh, Lots of people say descended. Māori like to say ascended from. Everything's always moving upwards. So you are ascended from your from your tūpuna, from your ancestors. Um, and so moko basically is the continuation and the marking of that. Uh, so, so it represents you as an individual and everything that you have come from uh, in your life and through your heritage um, to be here today. Uh, at least moko on the face like if we talk about the fa facial moko for a start because of course moko moko now is a is a broad term that refers to everything you know all oh, okay, over the body okay. all our traditional markings on the body are, are called moko so everything this all this is moko in my context yeah. um uh but specifically the face which of course is the one that we're really famous for yeah. um is uh yeah it's just a representation of your heritage and and so it's become i feel like it's become it was sacred anyway. It is one of our most sacred practices, but it's become exceptionally sacred due to its, you know, nearly lost nature. You know, the yeah, fact that it was yeah. nearly nearly lost to the to the oppression of of colonization. So, for those of us who are trying to revive it in the past fifty, sixty years, I would say has been a big burst of revival for Moko, um, and trying to destigmatize it. Um, decolonize it you know re-educate and re-inform people about what it is and what it represents because there's yet you know, lots of stigmas and lots of misinformation out there about it um and also try and give a little bit of worth back to our people who don't feel worthy you know they feel so disconnected and so affected by what colonization has done to us and and every other indigenous culture around yeah. the world that um we can we're trying to uh yeah bring a bring a little bit of mana back to our people and to to our practices you know so it's been a pretty cool thing um a, that has come along with me getting it is then because of what's happened for me in social media since then being able to impart that inspiration or education onto yeah. people and i've even had messages you know it's one of the one of the highlights and the reasons i keep doing the social media thing is you'll have someone message you and go man 
I got my muckle done because I watched your video and you go, oh. yes, go, you know, like that's exactly what I'm doing it for right there. You know, that's the whole reason is having one, one person, man, one person go, I'm going to get it done or I've reconnected or even I just want to learn the language, whatever it might yeah. be, you know, um, Super is sick. so, yeah, it's real cool. So can you like add on to your muckle, like through, um, I guess like events that play out through your life? yeah yeah there is so as it currently stands i only have the bottom half of my face I, uh, of course most people are familiar with muckle because it covers the whole face uh, at least on a man anyway um and so at some point in my life i'll have to finish it off you know and, and get the get the top of my face done um and all my cheeks my cheeks are also mm. empty as well right now and so yeah th that'll come and that'll evolve at whatever appropriate moments funnily enough i don't know what those moments are yeah, you know, they're not yeah. something that i decide they're something that your artist will decide so say in five years i message my artist and they go hey man you know how you been and i hear this house sort of vibing with life right now and this is blah 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 and he'll go come in, you know come in let's, let's let's add some more or something or he'll go nah not yet and i don't know what makes him decide that yeah. that's up to him <laughs> as the as the you know the the master and the of of our craft and of our traditions um so but you definitely you definitely the goal is to have it all done by the end of your life anyway you know and it's yeah. definitely not complete sick i re yeah i think moko are very beautiful so how did you overcome or if you had stage fright when performing what are some methods that you can do to overcome it Funnily enough, I um at least in the context of alien weaponry, I never I never get nervous before I go on stage. Oh, it doesn't sick. matter if the crowd is the huge fifty thousand crowds that we've played to or two hundred people. Or well, arguably I, I will say that if I do get more nervous, it's in smaller crowds. Because small crowds are very personal. You know, they're yeah. standing here, they're much closer, there's much less room for error you know it's much more intimate uh, yeah. those ones can make you a little bit more uh prone to getting a little bit nervous but the bigger the crowd for me it just you get a little bit disconnected because those crowds like at those big festivals you know where there's just so many people they're so far away you know they're yeah. probably five they're so far away and you're way up on the stage and I also need glasses and I don't wear them on stage and I don't wear contacts. So I can't even see them at that point. Like they're just a blur. It's just a blur of skin color. And so when I'm up on stage and it's 50,000 people, pff, couldn't tell me, right? I can't even see anyone's face. So I'm just running around having a good time. But 200 people that are standing right there, you go, oh. <laughs> but no, I was just, I was just thinking if you're having fun, <laughs> You know, having fun is the key. You just relax when you're having fun. Yeah. You know, let the adrenaline, like let the adrenaline, because what you get is the adrenaline, right? Which is a similar sensation to being nervous. Yeah. But so let the adrenaline just drive you, you know, before you know it as well. When we go out on stage, it doesn't matter if it's half an hour or an hour and a half, it goes like that, you yeah. know. If you feel like you've stood on stage and next minute you're walking off already. Um, so yeah, just let the adrenaline drive and have fun with it normally. You know, the fans as well, unless you're really playing terribly, they also don't care. You know, I mean people are worried, of course, because as the musician we notice when we make a mistake. Yeah, of course. The crowds don't, unless you're really making a mistake, the crowds will never pick it out, you know. They don't know whether you're making a mistake. So I always just go, just play it, man. Just play it. They're not gonna be bummed over one little wrong note, you know. They're just yeah. having a great time. That's funny. <laughs> So, um, I don't think I'm familiar with any, like, traditional Maori foods. Could you, like, go over some of your favorites? Yeah, so it's, lot, the reason lots of people aren't familiar is because there aren't that many. So it's it's one of those misconceptions or, or misunderstandings is that we didn't really have a lot of traditional foods. Like, nothing nothing that sets apart, you know, that that sets you apart from anybody else like mm. catching a fish and eating a fish is not a traditional food right it's yeah, just catching yeah, a fish yeah. and eating a fish and because that's kind of how we went about food it literally simple is catch fish eat the fish you know you didn't really turn it into a dish you weren't cooking this extravagant meal with it it was just catch the fish and eat the fish or salt it <laughs> kill the bird yeah kill the bird and eat the bird you know what i mean so like lots of people are surprised to hear we just pretty much ate from kill to plate you know what i mean barbecue um, but of course the most famous um way of cooking 
uh, it's called what we call the hangi, uh, which of course is it's a prevalent cooking style across all of Polynesia anyway, which is cooking in the umu, the, oh, the okay. earth oven, yeah, right? Yeah. So dig the pit, and any Polynesian probably knows what the heck we're talking about. Yeah. You, know, you, you dig it up, heat up the rocks, put the rocks in, wrap up the kai, wrap up the food, put it in, cover it up, and let it slow cook, right? It's like an yeah. earth slow cooker. Um, so that is probably our most famous traditional way of cooking or eating food and you, again you just put meat and vegetables in there you know um we've also adopted like ikamata from the other islands which is raw fish um, okay so basically raw fish and cream and you just put it all up and that's one of the best tasting ones for sure that that's probably my favorite but i'm not sure it's something that we did traditionally i think we've borrowed it from the other islands mm. yeah, it's very prevalent on rarotonga do ikamata so a lot were there um, like any um staple crops that you guys couldn't grow in Aotearoa just because it's colder? Yeah, than lots, Aotearoa? lots of them. Lots of the stuff that we brought over from Polynesia couldn't grow here, and the only thing that could grow here was the kumara or the sweet potato. Oh, um, no taro. And so, no, no, we didn't grow taro here either. So there's um lots of stuff that when we brought over here, which is what caused a lot of the Boring. early we were talking about the warring yeah uh, so lots of the maori wars happened because of kumara mm. cultivation because of the way that kumara at the time could be cultivated you would put it into the land and once you pulled it out you couldn't then grow it again in the same yeah bit of it land sucks all the so you would have out. to yeah you'd have to keep moving and then of course what happens when you keep moving is you start running out of land yeah. also because at that period of course lots of people come to new zealand now and they see modern new zealand but it's hard for people to realize that back then when maori first arrived here new zealand was dense bush you know what i mean yeah like, yeah exceptionally yeah. dense bush where you couldn't no sunlight was getting through the trees to the ground you know what i mean so if you had the very rare areas that were cleared and of course we would have cleared some ourselves but we're talking dense yeah. um that land that is actually available for growing is very minor you know yeah. they were a big country there was lots of land that you can't use and and well i've seen some of the hawaiian bush or right i don't even know if rainforest bush what you'd classify it yeah over there. we have we have um, rainforest and yeah well i've seen footage and videos and stuff of it over there and it's similar it's similar here you know but i've just here it's just on a bigger scale yeah. and a bigger land mass everything um, over I... there is a bigger scale like your guys rivers are huge your mountains yes. are huge like yeah, I trip on like the geography of New Zealand because it's like not volcanic islands, right? Isn't it like continental? Well, no, lakes? we do, um, we do have lots of volcanoes as well. Um, and actually, Lake Taupo, which is our big lake in the middle, is actually a, a one of those mega volcano things. Oh shit! They call them. It's like super crazy. Yeah, like if it blows, ones, then like freaking... you're like done for. Yeah. <laughs> no more country left. Um, yeah, and lots of our famous mountains are all volcanoes as well. Um, okay. So there's lots of volcanic activity, um, and and that shows, of course, in the landscapes and its history and however that works from a ge geographical evolution standpoint. I don't know. Too were sciencey you guys, for me. Were you guys affected by that um, volcanic eruption in Tonga a few years ago? Yeah, we got earthquakes from that, I believe. You know, we had earthquakes and tsunami warnings and, and, and all that stuff. Um, not from the actual volcano itself, of course, but the... The consequences of, of yeah, that sort the of aftermath, eruption yeah. the aftermath could you guys see like the ash plume and stuff no no not from not from here um but definitely got the uh environmental effects mm. so um break my bad i lost my place <laughs> no you're good hawaiians and maoris share a lot of um similarities when it comes to their i guess we call them mo'olelo I don't, I'm not sure what the Maori term is for, like, like stories, history, yep. myths, legends. Could you um, tell us one of your favorite Mo'olelo and give us a brief summary of it? Yeah, well, of course. Uh, so our word for it is Puraka, um, which is your yeah, story. Um, Puraka? Uh, yeah, Puraka. I, I don't know oh, what the history is. Rako means um, tree, right? It's like it's Rako is our word for tree or wood. Um, so maybe it's like, I don't know. I wouldn't know what the etymology, what's the word? I mean, <laughs> yeah, fancy yeah. Word. Like why a word is the way it is, but yeah, it's what, it's the word that we use for, um, stories anyway. 
And you're right, we do share a lot of them, of course. Um, lots of lot. While well, all the Polynesia shares Maui, and obviously yeah, the fruits yeah. of Maui, and so Maui's. Well, for us, he slows the sun. That's a yeah. very popular one. And, of course, he fishes up the islands in which you live on, yeah. which I think he does across the board as well. You know, he's done lots of things. For us, he also steals fire. Yeah. So we got how Maui found fire. And then um, also Maui's death. So Maui's death for Maori, I, I, I don't know if that is um, across the board. Um, it's, it's rather like dark. All those other ones are always told as like kid stories. You know, Maui yeah. slows the sun. Yeah. Maui. But Maui's death is never told as a kid's story because it's it's rather adult and dark in nature. A, a, to be fair, as is the nature of creation stories and or myths. No, in yeah, general, they have they have you know? very adult themes. Yes, when you actually go and listen to the real versions, yeah, you, know, you go, oh no, these are dark anyway. But so for for Maori, uh, Hine Nui Te Po is is our goddess of the underworld or or she's considered sort of the maiden of death and she ushers our dead into into uh well back to hawaii i guess in in our context um and yeah she is the mother of death basically so she gave birth to death so maui being maui and being the trickster and that that he is wanted to be immortal you know, it was his, it was his last feat. He'd done all these amazing things, and the, the last um, hurdle he wanted to beat was death itself. And so in his mind, he said, well, if Hinenui Te Po is the mother of death, she gave birth to death, to undo death is to undo the birth of death. So he thought he would literally reverse the birth cycle of death. So he takes him and a bunch of his friends, which are birds, a Maui. Well, I think Maui's a shapeshifter across the board. Yeah, but, he, know, our Maui can he's... turn into a chicken. Yeah, yeah, he could turn into all sorts of things, right? And so, so for us, he took a lot of his friends, which were birds, on his journey to keep him company to Hininui Te Po. And he finally visits Hininui Te Po, and she's asleep. And he goes, all right, all right, everyone, you know, shh, everyone be quiet. Um, you guys stay here. I'm going to go do this. Now, basically what he does is, if you're imagining a giant woman, right, she's asleep and she's got her legs open, right? And obviously we, we all know how birth works. So Maui wants to reverse it, right? So he goes to do exactly that. He crawls in from the bottom and the, his mates that he brought with him thought it was so funny what they were doing that they laughed, right? So they started laughing and chirp, 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 chirp and <laughs> laughing and cracking up about what Maui was doing. And Maui's like, you know, he's crawling in and he's like, wait, stop, you're going to wake her up. And Hini Nui Te Po wakes up and she closes her legs and crushes Maui to death. Oh, and just so, like that? Just like that. The just Maui crushes her. that did like the all Maui. of that. Other stuff. All of that. He, he, he was killed because his friends were too busy, snoo, too snoo. busy laughing. Yep. Death by snoo yep. snoo. Like, <laughs> That's, future right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and so for us, that is how the end to the great Maui is. He tried to reverse <laughs> death itself and death said no. And so <laughs> that is why nobody is, nobody is um, safe from death. Yeah. Death will get everybody. And so oh, that that's that's especially if for you're us. A Maui, bro, like that guy. Yeah. So for us, that's our end to the great Maui, um, which I think is one of the stories that's slightly unique because, like I said, we all have the sun yeah, one, the yeah, island one. But I was like, story. I've never heard anyone talk about the his death before. But so that's how he dies for us. That's so yeah. clear. Death by snoo snoo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Um, what are some other aspects of Maori culture that don't really get um, a lot of, I guess, exposure, but is really, I guess, Maori specific? Yeah, it's an interesting one because I do feel like because of what Maori has become, like from a from an identity perspective, you know, like everything about it the tourism plays a part of this you know like the tourism of maori um there's not a lot that people are potentially surprised about maybe to be fair normally it's like weird ignorant foreigner stuff you know like mm. uh, and and normally like you know white american stuff is the whole like when they come over here they go 
oh wait you guys live in normal houses yeah bro they think that about Hawaii <laughs> too and you go what are you talking about man like yeah we do we're not in in our hut still you know yeah, what i mean we're not in our hut. Like, we're, we're... yeah 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 exactly i'm like so lots of lots of the stuff that surprises people is just that sort of general ignorance porous ignorance you know yeah. but like in terms of people know about our language obviously people know what haka is people know what moko is maybe you could argue that not enough people know what it really is but you know they know what it is to see it um i think uh, yeah a big thing is what i talked about earlier you know is realizing that maori isn't a singular worldview you know it's not a singular rule set of rules it's not a singular way of governing our people you know it is there's multiple different ways that we as people would govern our own people and uh, the word for it for us is tikanga mm. uh, which is basically like customs and protocols and those differ you know yeah, uh, yeah in some places um men and women can do haka in some places only men can do haka you know like there's everyone's got their own different ways and there's not one singular maori rule maori law um and lots of people just don't realize that but we already talked about that yeah yeah so i feel like um previously i feel like now like everybody thinks of maori they think haka moko but I feel like when I was growing up, everybody would think of Pukana. Right. Or Pukana. Yes. Can, yes. You, can you um just share the Mana'o behind that aspect? Yeah, so so the Pukana, for anyone that doesn't know, well, actually, to be fair, the Pukana specifically is just the eyes. So it's the flaring of the eyes, right? So, which is why across man or woman, you'll see the, yeah, the eyes, yeah, right? Yeah. Now, of course, where people tend to point out the differences is men poke the tongue out, and women do the like the frown yeah yeah the the up yeah yeah that thing um and so the tongue is actually called a fetero um or pukana fetero people will say because it's it's always done in unison with pukana um but so basically it's just it is just a a form of expression you know i guess um, it's a sort of a, and the fetero itself specifically was used as a threat. So for war parties that were up against each other, the the fetero part of it was a threat that if you were defeated in battle, you would I'm be eating eaten, you, right? Your You'd mana is your... mine. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So it was seen. So yeah, for anyone listening who doesn't realize, cannibalism was practiced by Maori, but it wasn't for sustenance. It was a yeah, form yeah, yeah. of belittlement or um i guess absorbing power right like it's like that taking somebody's mana away from them and consuming it for yourself so for maori it was the ultimate disrespect yeah you know? like, like shitting you know, on your enemy basically it was as bad as it could get was to be eaten by your enemy was considered the most highest form of disgrace yeah, you you're could like ever, prey. You know? you're not even yeah, yeah exactly and so um the fetero was a threat for that disrespect okay i i just wanted life. to confirm that because yeah i heard that it was like to signify right. that i'm gonna eat you but i wanted yes, to hear that yeah. from a maori person which is why women don't do it because yeah. women aren't in the war parties yeah yeah, right? yeah. So they, they were never the ones doing it because they weren't the ones fighting um on so, the field could you give us like a little brief summary of like the timeline of new zealand's history that you're, you're oh yeah familiar with this is uh, i'm terrible with numbers but um uh, basically at least maori history maori history is broken up into um three periods as far as i'm a, i'm aware you know settling period transitional period and then the traditional uh transitional and then the traditional mm. period <laughs> uh now i'm terrible with dates um but let's say early thousands you know like 1100 1200 i okay. think is I think 1200 is normally what people say is when our Maui ancestors arrived here. So, so one thing that lots of people think is that Maori arrived here, you know, uh, but Maori didn't arrive here. Our early Polynesian ancestors arrived here um, from wherever they came from. We say Hawaii, but Hawaii, of course, is is more metaphorical than it is. Yeah. 
genuine. You know, of course, it could be Rarotonga, could be Tahiti, could be wherever. Yeah. Um, but we used to say Hawaii. Yeah. Um, so the early Polynesian settler arrived in Aotearoa first. So that's the settler period. Then and there's you the call transitional them period. Versus Maori. Yeah, Maori. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that like um like a similar word? I guess synonym to each other. Yeah, well, it's basically like how you guys say Maori. Oh, right? okay, okay. It's just the, same word. Yeah. So Maori, Maori, Maori is the word that today is still used in Tahiti. Okay, um, okay, okay. Which Tahiti is the center of Polynesia, really. Yeah. And once upon a time, the center of the Polynesian kingdom, uh, they were the Hawaii, and then all the other islands were referred to as different iterations of Hawaii. So yeah. Hawaii Roa, Hawaii Raro, Hawaii, blah, 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 blah. Um, and uh, yeah, so Maui is what they still use today to refer to themselves like that word, which is the same as Maori and same as Maui and all that. Um, so they arrived here in that early period. Then the transitional period begins, which is where they start to develop and change from being Maori into Maori oh, as we yeah. know it. Because, of course, Cook Islanders are called Maori as well, right? So that's the other tricky thing is they use the same word. But New Zealand Maori, let's say New Zealand Maori, right? So the transitional period is where we start changing from early Polynesian, proto-Polynesian or whatever the word would be. your own... To starting to turn into what we know today as Maori, which is, you know, haka and moko and our style of carving and our style of weaving and all that. No, and your then, guys' weaving and your beadwork is, like, super, like, none needed. Yeah, it's different, hey? And because I've yeah. seen Hawaiian cloaks, you know, like like the king's yeah, cloaks yeah. and all that, and they're crazy, but they're very different. It's, like, yeah. very different styles yeah. of weaving. Um, and then the final period was the traditional period and that is where actually maori as we associate with maori today came about it was in that period so maori had fully developed into their own unique uh, polynesian culture with their own unique language and practices and protocols and all that stuff and then i imagine it's like the early 1800s or something late 1700s is when europeans arrived um and started the whole colonial yeah, process yeah. um and and the big significant moment for us was the treaty of waitangi uh which was the treaty signing between maori and british and after all the wars and yeah. after all that stuff um british were like okay let's just sign a treaty man because y'all keep whipping our ass in fights <laughs> but we're still british man. yeah you know like but we're still british and we still have a lot more people and a lot more firepower but it takes a lot of resources to do that let's just sign a piece of paper right and get it over and done with now i always say that's where they beat us right is in writing because writing was their thing you know war well war was all of our things but you know we were good at fighting but writing was the white man's game you know and so yeah. i always say that where they beat us was in that treaty because what they did there with that treaty is there's two versions of it that you can read there's a version that's completely in english and there's a version that's completely in te reo maori yeah the real version the real version but the version in te reo maori isn't actually a direct translation of the english version and so the Maori read the Maori version and thought they were signing for something else. Yeah, they got yeah. And basically got done over, like tricked into it, um, yeah. because the way we understood it is when it says you will, you know, cede sovereignty or whatever, whatever, yeah, whatever. Yeah. You know, Maori thought like, oh yeah, that means you guys can live here and do your own thing. You know, you can be British here on our lands, and we can be Maori here on our lands, and we'll just live in 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 unison, right? Yeah. And of course, the British were like, wait a second, bro. No, you're supposed to live with us, bro. You're trying yeah. to live with us by our rules. And we were like, hey, no, but we didn't find that out till after. And we're gonna sell <laughs> yeah. <it>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so that of course led to the next round of conflict was after we realized that we'd signed something we didn't actually understand or agree yeah. to by their standards yeah. but that's of course because the british in the end took their version as the gospel not the maori version yeah. as the gospel yeah. right so um and then and then only fast forward 150 years and we're now here in 2023 yeah. and still fighting the fight you know but of yeah. course at the same time we are a very we are new zealand now 
You know what I mean? Like it's a, it is a very mixed country. You it know? is, so it, but we're trying to find this balance between. You know, we just want the inclusion of Maori. Them, you know, lot, what lots of people are fighting for right now is co-governance, right? So yeah, co-governance in the country, so that Maori govern as equally as non-Maori do in New Zealand, in line with what the treaty promised, right? So really, we're just trying to have them honor the treaty uh, in twenty twenty three and create the New Zealand that Maori wanted not the new zealand that the british wanted yeah so that's kind of where we're at wasn't there um talks about renaming the country back to aotearoa there is there's always been a it was never official talks uh yeah you know, that was always community driven or well in the new zealand political system we have the mixed member parliament system um for for governing and we have a maori party um and I believe Maori Party particularly pushed for that um, for that renaming to happen um, amongst the public, but it was never something I think that actually got officially, you know, processed. Um, it's interesting because, like me personally, I think we're better off aiming for Aotearoa New Zealand, you know like a like a you use both of them which dash. is what i do in my videos of yeah, yeah dash yeah. aotearoa dash new zealand um versus completely going to aotearoa just yet yeah. just yet yeah. you know like Familiarize baby steps yeah. baby steps you know uh which i think lots of the time in these moments of sort of um protest we quite often want to jump in the deep end and then it ends up going nowhere of course <laughs> yeah. because People aren't going to go, I don't want to change the name of the whole country. But I'm like, if we just get people comfortable going out there or New Zealand, you know, and then maybe one day we can. What is even old Zealand? It's a, it's a, it's a region in Denmark. Don't quote me on that, but it's somewhere over there because the man that actually named it wasn't British. He was, he was Abel Tasman and he was Dutch. He was a Dutch explorer, oh. I believe. Um, and he well, he lived in the region of Zealand. Mm. So when he discovered here, uh, he called it New Zealand, <laughs> which is where that comes. So it's not even a British name either. Yeah, you know, yeah. Even a... And you guys got the Union Jack, you know, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. So one of my favorite Maori proverbs is kanohi kite kanohi tangata kite tangata. Can you... Yep. um? Give us your translation about what that means, and then also give us one of your favorite Maori proverbs. Yeah, so uh, kanohi means face or head. Um, yeah. So, like when we specifically in my videos, you'll hear me say moko kanohi, which mm -hmm. means moko on the face. So, kanohi kite kanohi means face to face. Tangata is our person for, as our word for person, like kanaka, right? Okay. It's the same word. Um, so, yeah, tangata, ta, kite tangata. So face to face, man to man, person to person, whatever you want to say, you know, is about. I guess it's, for me, that's about our, our, um, you know, nature as oral as oral tradition peoples. You know, everything happens like this. You know, you're face to face. It's person to person. It's not um, like I always say when I talk about when people ask me about the meaning. You know, like oh, what does your moko mean specifically? Mm. I mean, like. What does each line mean? Yeah, yeah. When my moko artist, I asked my moko artist, like, what are the rules, if any, about sharing that information with people? And he said that. Kanohi kite kanohi, tangata kite tangata. Oh. Face to face, person to person, right? So he says, you can tell people, but don't tell them on the phone. Don't, like, put it on social yeah, media, because yeah. that's not actually, you know. But if, you, someone, if you're talking to somebody in person, that's how our people shared information. So that's how we can continue to share information. Um, and so that's sort of, yeah, I just see that phrase as a, as a development and understanding of that way that we have as, as oral, um, storytellers and, and tradition passes, whatever the word is. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> um, uh, one of my favorite proverbs, um, probably... Uh, how does it go? It's like kaore uh, te kumara e korero mo tōna akereka, which basically is, I might have the order of that a bit backwards, but whakatoki. Whakatoki is what we call proverb in Māori. Um, oh. 
but they're always a little bit weird in their grammar, or at least by modern Maori standards, you know, they're not something that's necessarily absolutely translatable. So sometimes if I forget it and I go, what's the order? It's not because I can't apply my modern Maori <laughs> knowledge to it because they're sayings that are much older, but basically it means the kumara or the sweet potato does not speak about how sweet it is. So oh. It's like a, a humility thing, yeah. right? So let let others speak your praise. When you eat the when like if I eat a kumara, I go, mm, the kumara is so sweet. The kumara doesn't tell me how sweet it is. Yeah. I tell it how sweet yeah. it is, right? So that's basically a proverb about um, humility. humility. Yeah. Another very good one is fire te eat uh, ihi kahurangi kite tu hui koe he maunga teite, which is basically um, bow to nothing. Unless it's a lofty mountain, which means don't, you know, always strive for the highest, yeah, yeah. Um, highest form of achievement. And don't let, of course, humans are never bigger than the mountain. Yeah. So never bow down to anybody who's trying to tell you otherwise, you know, um, only bow to the greatness that is the mountain, basically. That's so cool. So those, those are two of my sort of common, commonly used ones. Whether I have them even in the right orders is up for debate. <laughs> what is what is your guys' word for um, proverbs? Well, there's two. Fakatoki is the most commonly used one, uh, but a fakatoki specifically is a phrase where they do not know who created it. Like they do oh, not know okay. the origin. It's like freaking, it's been in Maori stuff for long, long for so time. long. Yeah. Uh, whereas fakatoaki is a proverb where you know who authored said it. it. Like it's a quote. Oh, yeah. Okay. So okay. there's two. Basically the same words, one of them just got the A. Fakatoki yeah. and Fakatoaki um, are our words for proverbs. Sick, okay, yeah. Hawaiians is olelo no el. Oh, yeah. Y Y'all like to use that word, olelo, a lot. Yeah, yeah. Pretty That's the, for, for us, the same word is korero. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and it, you know, yeah olelo thing. means like language, to talk. Yeah, freaking yeah for sing. us it means to talk. Yeah. So. So um, both Hawaiians and Maoris had to navigate the challenges of colonization. But however, I feel like Maori um, dealt with it, I guess, in a better way. Like, what would you attribute that to? Sometimes I think it's, um, we talked about this a bit earlier. I can't remember yeah. if that was before the chat yeah. or not, but... Um geographical location i think is a lot of it you know mm. uh, geographical advantages like we said of the united states obviously right well obviously you've got you've still got james cook's history as well <laughs> so you still have that uh and then of course you had uh the occupation by the united states and the united states is yeah like we said right there you know it's much harder to avoid the constant um Pressure. Onslaught, yeah, I suppose, yeah, exactly. pressure from colonial pressure. Whereas New Zealand and the United Kingdom is so detached by the time they finally get here, you know, that like, uh, not that it hasn't been without its challenges, but it's just made it easier, I think, in, yeah. the, in the ability for revitalization. And, and as we know, Maori were staunch. You know, not to say that the yeah. other Polynesian cultures aren't staunch, but, you know, Māori are known to be so staunch. And so I think that's why, even though they got close, I always say there's probably from the 1900s to the 1950s, I would say was the most dangerous period for Māori culture. I'd say mm. if we nearly completely lost everything, it was in that 50-year period. Basically in 1904, Four, I believe, the government, the New Zealand, New Zealand government passed a bill that we call the Tohunga Suppression Act. Uh, tohunga is the equivalent of your kahuna word. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, basically, your masters, your experts, right, um, of things. So the Tohunga Suppression Act um, basically made it illegal for our tohunga to pass down their skills. So that was in relation to Maori medicine, Maori uh, moko, you know, Maori language. The people that were masters in those fields weren't allowed by law to teach it to anybody. So fast forward, you know, one generation, 1920, 1925, 
you've got nothing. There's nearly no language. There's nearly no moko. You know, there's oh. no rongoa, which is Maori medicine. Like Maori culture, it was nearly lost because of that bill, because it was made illegal to basically practice anything, you know. Yeah. And that's where we start seeing like my great grandmother who was born speaking Maori, but was beaten for speaking it in school. So if you spoke Maori at school and not English, you'd get beaten. And so, of course, that creates a whole lot of trauma around speaking your own language or being Māori. So then when she had her kids, which were my grandparents, she doesn't teach them Māori. You know, you don't yeah. teach them how to speak Māori. So they grow up only speaking English. Yeah. So then my mum and dad only grow up speaking English. And then same, so like you start to very quickly, the generations yeah. get lost very quickly. And that's, that's a, not a unique tale either. You know, we see that all over the yeah. world. Um, but it was in that period. Early 1900s, so about 1950s, I, th I would say that was like that. If we were nearly lost it, it was there. And Damn. the 60s saw a big rise all of a sudden um, in things Māori. And all of a sudden, the, the protests started. You know, those lost generations started to realize what they'd lost and were like, hold on, we need to do something about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, there's a, it's that interesting thing where we saw it as well um, in avenues like the gangs, right? So yeah. one of the big stigmas here is that uh, moko is a gang, gang member yeah. thing, right? for gangs. And the reason why is a very good reason. It's because in the 60s and 70s, we hadn't seen moko in nearly 50 years, right? Because it was made illegal. The only places that still had it were very, very rural I mean, you know, out in the bush, Māori that still really lived out in the bush, way, way away from like, Law. developing society. Yeah, at the time. yeah. Um, and they were predominantly women that kept it alive during those periods oh, as well. Sick. Um, because there's another history to why men's moko was nearly lost as well with the whole uh, head head hunting trade that happened. Bruh. So a lot of factors. I heard um, about that shit. Yeah. That's. And so in the 60s, the gangs, obviously gangs, what do gangs do? They are anti-establishment, right? They're anti the governments, they're anti all that stuff. Super. And at this time, they were predominantly made up of Māori, right? Because Māori were also being, or felt like they were being treated with a higher injustice, right? Yeah, at um, home. And s at home, right? So what did they do? Well, the government tells you that you can't get moko. So they all went and started getting moko done, right? So so gangs were actually a huge part of the revival of moko in general. Exactly. Just as a big, like, F you to the government, yeah. right? Then what happened, though, of course, was there were a few people who still actually held the knowledge of moko, mm. and they just weren't, they weren't practicing it, yeah. you know, because they were being safe. But they knew they had that part of it. And they saw the gangs getting it done, and they went, this is good. This is good because it's putting it back up into the public face, but we need to be careful because they, some of them would argue that gangs having it is a misrepresentation of what it is, right? Um, yeah. Of what mukul means. You, you know, don't want to tie it to like bad stuff. You don't want to have it associated with bad things. So actually it was the man who did my mukul, the man that taught him. So his great uncle or whatever. His so uncle, your, your, um, was one of the, in yeah. He um he was one of the men that was part of that early revival period. So they banded together the people that had the knowledge and were like, let's start doing this. Let's start putting it back on our people. Oh, like a hui. Um, kind of right. Yeah. And they were like, let's start let's start reviving it so we can try and veer it away from the gang yeah, image. Yeah. Uh, without trying to diminish what the gangs Their, had done. For yeah. Them, you exactly. know, like they had brought it back. And we just want to now, or they, I mean, wanted to just bring it back in Positively. a positive light. Yeah, yeah. Um, and thus created the great Mukul revival of the, yeah, early 80s, yeah. late 70s, early 80s to where we are today, where people like myself can go out and get it done. And not without its issues, but, you know, more confidently and more safely and and hopefully. Uh, but yeah, so, so Māori definitely have had this troubles with it, but that late, 1900s period maori for some reason just really were like you know what screw this and yeah. had a huge sort of burst civil in, rights um, movement kind of uh, uh, one of our most famous protests of course was a woman called fina cooper who was an old an old maori woman who walked she walked from the very top of new zealand to parliament 
Um, and along the way, she met up with all the different iwi, and she collected people for her walk that wanted to protest with her. And that's all they did. They just walked. They walked the entire length of the North Island. And the parliament is in Wellington, right at the bottom of the North Island. Uh -huh. um, and along the way, stopped at all the iwi and collected people who wanted to join her. And by the end of it, had a whole walking caravan that she and she was an old lady i mean we're talking walking stick and she did she walked the whole thing and that was to protest uh yeah maori rights and maori language and that sort of thing so she's one of our famous activists as well she's a hammer um, yeah and so that era you know really started to kick up um maori activism for sure oh that's super interesting stuff bro like it's cool how you're so well versed in all of that I try to be. It's it's hard sometimes. I'm not. A, I, I, you know, I'm always bad with the dates and that. So I'm sure some people watch and go, "Wait, is that's not right?" But I go, the, "The vibe, the gist is there." <laughs> so, um, what are some of your interests outside of music and your culture? Yeah, I mean, so we talked a bit before, but I like playing games and that. You know, of course, and um, uh, film. Film is a big passion of mine. So, um, like you like when filming? I was in the watching film oh okay um, okay predominantly like as a as a consumer movie film. critic i like doing yeah that too, yeah yeah movie guy you know i write and record all my stuff on letterboxd you know classic letterboxd um but uh, before i was in the band like i was at university for animation you know so i was oh, doing study, studying film and animation there as well so i've always had a passion for film um, and I like to surf as well, of course. How can you not when you live on the beach, huh? You know? Uh, so surfing as well. And, you know, sort of the odd bit of outdoor sports and that. So I like to do um, climbing and that sort of thing. But honestly, music takes up a lot of it, you know? Even though I do it for a job now, it's always been one of my main hobbies anyway. Yeah, you know, yeah. like, all this. Lots of this didn't come from the band, you know. I had this anyway. You know, this was just my passion for music, <laughs> and 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 the band allowed me to actually do something with it. Um, but Sick. music has always and artwork, of course, and and specifically Maori artwork, you know. Yeah. So I um I, I sell my artwork and that on to my followers now, which is cool. Once upon a time, I just did it for fun, but now I can actually do something with it, you know, which has always been pretty sweet. And so yeah. I've always had a passion for for Maori art and Maori art forms. Um, so always always trying to win develop that knowledge knowledge more every day super cool bro so are there any um aspects of hawaiian culture that interests you and i think yeah well there's there's much. actually lots say eh? and and because like i said my girlfriend's um yeah yeah hawaiian her, her father is uh is native and mum is just american you know white american Papa. um and so uh there's been lots that I've uh, I, I've always been interested in uh, our connection to Polynesia from a very young age anyway you know but I, I only place I've actually ever been is Rarotonga um but like I said I'm going over for the first time in a, in about a month with her to see uh her whanau over there her family and but also one of my um very important mentors in my life was a native Hawaiian man who lives who lived here oh okay um, during high school and he was one of my very very important figure in my life but he actually passed away during covid not from covid but during that time mm. period and so of course he returned back home and was buried over there but because it was covid you know couldn't do any of the funeral yeah. proceedings and all that stuff so i'm also been waiting to be able to go over to Pay you know visit respect. visit his visit his grave so I finally get to do that after three years or whatever it's been you know since i uh, really looking forward to that but there's lots you know i've always wanted to see the see the um the weavings in that because i've only seen pictures of it you know uh, yeah. but my mum my mum does maori weaving so she does our um traditional weaving and and we're fascinated at the differences and and yeah. the color use and the feather use and that sort of things that you see you know yeah um and then um there's all sorts of stuff and because of course um well you guys isn't it called ha'a it's like haka yeah, but that's like a more modern kind of like they just made that because like Maori's have haka. Oh, was that was that actually made after the fact? Was yeah. it? So that was made. Why is it hula, bro? Come on. Oh yeah, of course. And I well, yeah. I wonder because we of course have we have more than haka, of course. Yeah, for yeah, Mali yeah. So I was like, do they have like a specific performance that is more like? Haka is because of we course had, we like, have lots um, of performance. Oli and 
but I don't, there wasn't any, like, well, from my studies and my experiences, like, I haven't found any, like, traditional sources of the ha'a. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, because that's lots of tricky things there. You know, we talk about, I talk about that a lot with people. It's like, how much is actually truly old and how much is like even our haka right the the maori haka the stuff that people watch today is not haka that we would have had in, back like, when you know because yeah. haka has become such an identifying piece of maori dim we have like Put your, evolved yeah. it yeah like it's become way bigger than it necessarily you know we've got all these haka competitions now that it's so choreographed and it's great. Like it looks yeah. amazing, you know, but I'm like always hoping I was, I hope people don't think that this sort of performance is what we would have done on the battlefield. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. I was like, we weren't getting all like choreographed. <laughs> like we were the Jabberwockies at a dance show. You know what I mean? I was like, <laughs> this, I was like, it's just not how it works, you know? But so it's always curious to see what is truly a part of old culture or what again, yeah, is a part of the yeah. interbreeding and evolutions of culture, you know? And then, cause like we have, yeah, we have plenty of performance that's not haka, you know, we do poi and and and, yeah. and rako stuff. Poi is and super poi is, cool. Yeah, poi is one that we're well known for yeah. is with the swinging, the swinging balls in it, you know. So I didn't know, of course, if hula is just a part of a style and then there's other styles as well, you know. Mm. What what broad terminology there might be for different styles of performance and all that, you know. Yeah, I see what you mean. Um, Actually, Olelo Hawaii too is something that I would like to learn once I get Te Reo Māori down, like, solid, you know. Because I also think they'd go hand in hand, oh, you no, know. Once bro, you knew one, yeah. if you could fully speak one, you could easily pick yeah. up the other. You just got to learn the words, you know. But structurally and all that, it's all... Speaking it's all of that, same. have you ever heard of the um, the famous navigator Tupaya? Yes. So, yeah, I... I'm super interested about Tupai. I think he's a hammer. And just like you said, every time he went to like a different Polynesian place, he would just speak his own Olelo, you know, but he could still talk to all of the natives yes. in their respected lands. And it works, right? Super, bro. And I just hate how like Captain Cook basically gets credit for all of Tupai's like like if it wasn't for Tupaya, Cook wouldn't have gotten to like anywhere yes. he's got. He's got of course, him. right? Like, I don't know what <laughs> they teach you guys about Captain Cook, but in Hawaii, we're not really a fan of that guy. We ate his ass. No, <laughs> no, yeah, the, 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 they weren't super. Um, I feel like here they didn't really talk about him. You know, it was like, oh yeah, Captain Cook was kind of around. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, then they, by. and then they just kind of yeah, then just kind of move on from it real quick. You know. Um, but of course, we still got, you know, lots of stuff still revolves around their name and their memory, you know. We got the James Cook Hotels and, you know, you've got all that, like the big grandeur of New Zealand is still using their names, you know. People people who's um, Spread were not necessarily and good disease. people. Bro, literally, yeah, exactly. it's like, listen to any of the native accounts of these people and, like, tell me, why are you honoring them? Yeah. And then the only places that they want to use Māori language is in, like, correctional facilities or prisons. And, yeah. you know, it's like, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, serious. That's the case in Hawaii, too. It's like, we literally have so much shit named after the people that overthrew our monarchy. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. why are we honoring these clowns, bro? They should be arrested and jailed for treason. No, no. Yeah, yeah, exactly. At least, at least y'all were the bunch that killed him. Yeah, <laughs> killed him in the end. Like we yeah. can't, we can't say that. His journey yeah, ended tough. in Hawaii. <laughs> that's right. I was like, that's tough, bro. That's tough business. <laughs> so I'm gonna attempt to say the longest place name, and it's oh, in a New classic. Zealand. And you're gonna tell me how good I am. Yeah, let's see so, if I can even. I can even remember it. How mata faka tanga hang. Koawa Tamatea Turi Puka Ka Piki Manga Horonu Ku Pokai Fenua Kitana Tahu. Hey, I mean, considering you're just reading it, that's pretty good, right? That's pretty good. Because, I mean, the only thing there is when you when you don't have to read it, you know, you just yeah. say that all together truncated and you've got yourself one word. It's an interesting word that I've always 
found it weird that it's even considered a word because it isn't actually a word. It's a sentence and it's a story. Um, oh, okay. Like a lot yeah. of place names in like Polynesian world. Yeah, view. pretty much, right? Like it is a truncation of multiple words, but that one's like a truncation of a whole paragraph. <laughs> do, you know, do it's you like instead it of it being one word. Oh, yeah, I think Tomata Faka Tangi Hanga Koro, Automate Tsuri Pu, Kaka Puki Momo Horonoku Pokai Fenu or Kitana Tahu. Oh, yeah, that, sounds, right that sounds yeah. slick. <laughs> What's the Motolelo behind that? So it is um, basically, it's about a man, Automate, I think is his name. So that's the Automate part. I'm pretty sure it's his name. Um, he was a man and he was in love with a woman. And so he climbed up the top of this mountain. And he played a nose flute. So like one of the traditional oh, Maori inf- instruments is a little flute thing. It's about like this big that you yeah. put in your nose and it makes a nice whistling sound. He stood up on the mountain and he played that for her, you know, to serenade her. Basically, that's a very shortened version of it. So it's basically the man. Lots of th- lots of the word itself is describing him. It's like automatia, oh, okay, the, hand, okay, okay. the man, the man with long hair you know, or whatever, right? Like it's it's actually just describing him the man who can step over mountains is like a whole thing um plays a nose flute for his loved one sick. That's, that's, basically the story, yeah. that's super sick yeah i feel like um our original place names for places they held like so much more thought and mana'o behind like yeah the name like in hawaii yeah there's this beach called sandy's and it's like no fucking shit there's gonna be yeah. sand at the beach like yeah, I've got one. We've got a Sandy's just uh, like an hour away from right. It's Island. like <laughs> what? Like how? How much thought went into naming this beach? But like yeah. the freaking original name for that area is uh, um Avava Malu, and it's like that has way more stuff. Like I guess meaning, you know? I don't know. I just... Yes, no, because that's before when we were talking about renaming, you know, New Zealand to Aotearoa. Land that one's fine and cool, cloud. you know, but. The one thing that I think is more important, and this is one that they're actually pushing for at the moment and quite pushing for, is restoring the Māori place names within the country. Um, yeah. Or at least having both. So on your road yeah, signs yeah. where you've got Sandy's Bay, above it shows whatever the, you know, if there's a Māori name for it, what it is. Yeah. Um, and so that is actually being really pushed right now more than the, than the country name change, which again, steps. But also arguably it's a step that's more important, you know, yeah. because... New Zealand, I suppose. It's not the worst name with, like, the worst history behind it. But, you know, like I said, when you've got James Cook Street, you know. Yeah, like, you really wanna, yeah. Or you really want to be... Re- like, oh, that's right, that you know. Guy, <laughs> that's right. And, like, where I live, Whangarei, right? Whangarei, of course, it's always been known as Whangarei. Luckily, it's one of the places that's always retained its Listening. Maori name. Yeah. But there's a huge story behind it, you know. Like, there's a huge story behind it about these two sisters that one of them they were like inseparable and one of them fell in love with a chief and the chief uh, wanted to take them away and he could fly on these giant eagles uh, you know well of <laughs> course new zealand did have the harst eagle which yeah it's a very very yeah. large eagle but not big enough for a human to fly but you know that's the the nature of big enough of, to uh, inspire more lelos <laughs> that's right that's right um and he picked them up on the giant eagle, but the giant eagle was only big enough for one person and the two sisters. So he got tired and stopped and told the one sister who wasn't getting married to wait. And her name was Ray. And so she stopped there and the eagle flew off with the sister who was getting married, but never came back to pick her up. And so Fangare, where I live, is the place where Ray waited and waited oh, and waited. Nice. So that, like, that's the history behind the name of the place, right? And so you go, you don't get that in James Cook Street. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or like Wellington, which is probably just from Duke Wellington or whatever. It's always Holy just a surname bro. or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, like there's no... yeah. Or even when Cook found Hawaii, he tried to call it the Sandwich Islands. It's like... <laughs> no, no. It's so like unimaginative, bro. No, no, no. Like, call it yeah. what they're calling themselves, please. Yes. That's another thing that trips me out too is like... How come we don't call other cultures what they call themselves? We make an English word for it. Like, Chinese people yeah. don't call themselves Chinese. 
Yes, I mean you could say that's like that's like the term Hawaiian, right? Yeah, I mean, like you yeah. said, Kanaka, Kanaka, or Kanaka Maoli, or whatever you guys use, you know, is your that's that's what it is. But we just go, oh yeah, Hawaiians, you know, ah it's, Samoans, it's so Cook crazy Islanders. how that like is a thing. Like Germans don't call themselves German; they say Deutsch. I'm Deutsch. Yeah, exactly, right. There's actually a word for that too. There's like a fancy word for like what that's called doing that because like yeah, everyone does that. Um, in the in language i suppose but yeah it's, it's a real interesting thing it's a real interesting thing and i go yeah it's not that hard to say yeah wow. they're like bro even because hawaii we get a lot of japanese tourists and like they're the ones that brought it to my attention at first because like i'd always be saying like oh japan japan and they'd always be like nippon and then they call yes, themselves right. nihongo and then yes. i'm like oh that's and then I started asking, like, oh, what do you guys call Koreans? And they're like, Kongoku. I'm like, ho, oh, so they, ah. have their, they have their <laughs> yeah, own yeah, yeah. names for freaking, like, why don't you guys just call them what they call themselves too? Yes. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Yeah. It's an interesting thing. That's what I mean. It's like, a, it is one of those things that's like a part of language evolution, I suppose. But it is strange. It's like, it could, it's not that hard to just call people Kanaka Maoli. Like literally case, what they introduce themselves as, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. No, I'm gonna construct a whole different word to fit my language for you. Yes. It's kind of funny too, bro, because like even um like in different languages, like animal sounds are different. Like yes. obviously in English cats they say meow, right? But in Japanese yes. they go nyan. <laughs> yes. No, that's a real interesting one. I see that all the time. And like lots of our in in maori the words for animals come from the name oh like okay. the sound they yeah, mean, yeah they come from the sound they make so like the um a more pork which is like a i would say it's closest to an owl it's like a nighttime bird anyway we call it a ruru and because at sound at night the sound <laughs> it makes is like Right, That's... so we're like it's a ruru. <laughs> so like lots of our words for things, like names for things, come from that sound they make. You know, like and so that shows what what people are thinking at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, you know. That's another. Uh, I I don't know. I feel like indigenous like mindset was just so much more common sense, but like on a spiritual mana like yes, it's just different to your ancestors. Yeah. So. Relating to um, mana and cosmogonic entities, who are some key players in the Maori cosmogonic genealogies? So, probably our... There's a few. I mean, the, the, the many versions of the Maori creation can span a whole... You know, it's a lot. There's a lot in there. But I would say... Our big contenders are Rangi and Papa, or Rangi yeah, Nui and Papa. Ruanuku, yeah. you guys have Papa, but I think you have a different name for what we call Rangi. Yeah, um, we either call her Wakea or Haumea. Yeah, that's the one. Um, and uh, so for us, of course, Rangi Nui is our sky father, and Papa Tuanuku is our earth mother. And so they are the parents of our... our... Uh, realm of existence which we call the Marama or the world of light yeah uh, yeah yeah that's and, so sick yeah and then our stories it's the separation myth or story so rangi and papa were wrapped in the internal embrace um as lovers and husband and wife and they were giving birth to their children which is the the uh the gods the mini atua. everything yeah yeah <laughs> yep um and it was like well, over seventy of them, but in the in the story, there's like a main a main five or seven, um, and anyway, all those all those god brothers were like crammed in the little space in the middle, right, mm. which was called Tepo or the night, yeah, um, the darkness, basically the darkness, and they were all being born in the middle like that, and they were crammed in there, and they're like, man, this sucks, and so <laughs> they were like, we need to get these our parents apart, and so Tane. That's our um, Kane. It is uh, the god of our forests. Yeah. Um, and also the, the strongest. He's always yeah. the, called the strongest the brother. Revered. Yes. Um, decided to separate them. Uh, two, which is our god of war. Who is uh, ours? Yeah. He was brought to Hawaii by 
Paolo, so he wasn't like always a. Uh... Oh yeah. Yeah. This this um, I guess Ali from Samoa. He brought that whole concept of war and gaining mana through sacrificing and right, right, that right, kind right, right. of mana. Before that, Hawaiians were like into Kane and Lono and Kanaloa. Yes, yes. Which are Tane Rongo and Tangaroa for us. Um, and so, yeah, the God Brothers were getting sick of it. Two was like, let's kill them. And everyone was like, bro, you're crazy, <laughs> man. Why, why you are, bro? Just chill out, you know? <laughs> so Tane was like, let's just push them apart, right? So Tane being the strong tree or, you know, forest yeah. nature entity that he is. Mm. In Aotearoa, actually, a couple hours away from where I live, we have the tree that we call Tane Mahuta. And, oh which is the, like, I guess, the physical embodiment that we associate yeah. with Tane here. Kino and he's just a huge tree. It's just a huge tree, a huge Cody tree, which stands way above every other tree in the country. And so we use him as our sort of physical idol, I suppose, yeah. of that story of him holding apart the parents because he, like, reaches way up into the sky or whatever. Um, so, yeah, Rangi Papa and then, yeah, Tane Tsu, Rongo, uh, Tangaroa, Ruo Moko as well, which is earthquakes. Um, Do you guys have Pele? No, so Ruo Moko is our version of Pele. Um, oh, okay, okay. Volcanoes and, and all that stuff. Um, and Ruo Moko for us is also the origin of Moko. So, oh, um, okay. Hence, okay. hence the name Ruo yeah. Moko. Um, because he, he is it the looks unborn. Like, hoi hoi, your guys Moko sometimes. Yeah. Um, he is the unborn child of rangi and papa so he was like a stillborn oh. so he still sits in the womb of papa tuanuku and tosses and turns like in his in the earth which causes earthquakes right um and earthquakes create scars yeah in the Being earth, they scar in the, the earth yeah, like which, so like like moko scars the face so that's where we get the word moko from so they that that is the significant Atua in our uh, in our realm, yeah. uh, and then there's a bunch of significant Atua that ascend in the, between, yeah, like... the heavens and that. So so Rehua is a very he belong, He's in the like tenth heaven. Um, he's the 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 his abode is the tenth heaven. Hinenui Tepo, who I talked about with the Maui death story, of course, she rules the underworld, the gateway to the dead. Yeah. So she's also Fido. Fido Te Tipua is the <laughs> evil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He is sort of the embodiment of evil. So he's like, yeah, our, our... Hades or whatever. Hades, yeah, dare I say. Uh, it's normally a bit of a slight misinterpretation. Yeah, of because what missionaries is. just associate like dark and... Yeah. Like, Polynesians associated that with, like, realms of, like, unknown knowledge, you know, like... But... Exactly, so... But Fido is that guy for us, so he's another significant player, you know, so there's lots, but, again, and at least in the main gods that descended from Rangi and Papa, or, like, our main gods, I should say, there's, like, 70, you know, there's more than 70 yeah, of them, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know them all. They all represent different things, and they're all descendants of one another, you know? Um, but then you... Uh, but then, of course, we also have a... A sort of a separate branch that follow the belief of Eeyore, mm -hmm. I O Eeyore, and now Eeyore. There's lots of debate about Eeyore. Um, he is definitely a Maori creation, but whether he existed pre-colonial contact is what's debated, yeah, yeah. because what Eeyore is is the supreme being, the one god. Now, like Allah. across <laughs> Polynesia. There's never really been yeah, that. one god. And we started to see Eeyore after people started introducing us the concept of Christianity and yeah. the one god. So lots of people argue that, not that it was necessarily made up by missionaries, but that Māori heard the concept of it through the Bible and just made their own version of influenced it. You know, like, by it. Yeah, they were influenced by it. So, so that one causes a lot of debate for people because lots of Māori do talk about Eeyore and they do follow the 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 concept of eel as the supreme the supreme creator so he will be another one that shows up a lot in terms of our significant ones me personally i don't i don't follow the eel stuff but he is significant enough to to note super sick freaking so um yeah so names have a huge um role i guess in polynesian culture whether it be like telling a story or like 
commemorating something someone did in their lifetime. Um, could you go over your whole name and what it means, if there's a story behind it? Yeah, so my full name is Turanga Puruini, and then Morgan Edmonds is my surname, Morgan hyphen Edmonds. Um, so the beginning part, Turanga Puruini for me is the names taken from two of my ancestors. Turanga Peke, who was the namesake of my tribe, and he was the the eponymous ancestor, I suppose, to yeah. our, our, our tribe. Yeah, and, and so he had a a chain of sons chiefs that were all named Turanga and then the third one had a daughter so she wasn't called Turanga and then she had my grandfather and then my grandfather wasn't called Turanga either because at that point we're talking very colonial New Zealand so he was just called John you know like he to, took like, on an English get name better opportunities yeah exactly right so he took on the English name had my mum so again, not called Turanga. And so then my mum decided to pick back up the lineage of Turanga with me. So so um, I got that name from him. And so that's on her side. And then Porowini comes from my dad's side, which was another uh, line of significant people uh, on my dad's tribal affiliations. And so they put them together, Turanga Porowini. Now, as individual names, yeah, they represent the ancestors those names come from but yeah. together it also works like it makes sense as a meaning so turanga means standing place or foundation or you know so sort of got roots in that sort of meaning and then Purawini means province or can mean oh. province right so so it sort of means the foundation of the province the standing place of your province province is your people you know so it's sort of like the, the, the foundation of your people is kind of what you can translate my definitely a leader people. name <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thanks, mom. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. That's a lot of pressure. Um, and then, of course, so Morgan Edmonds. So Edmonds is, there is uh, English, the English side of my family. So that's from John, John Edmonds, uh, who was a British sailor who married one of my great, great grandmothers, you know, on my Maori side. Uh, so we get the Edmonds name from him. And Morgan in my surname is back on my mum's side, but Morgan was just a made up Maori traditionally didn't have surnames. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? and we were just they would Turanga. take the last name. Or they would take their dad's first name as their last name when that yes, practice exactly. Around. And but then what happened, like you said, is if someone is reading a piece of paper and it says, you know, Turanga Purawini, they go, Oh, no, it's a Maori, yeah. right? Where if it says Savage. John Morgan, yeah, 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 yeah. When it says oh John Morgan, they go ah oh, cool, you know. So the Morgan name in my family came from that necessity to have an English name to get anywhere, yeah, right? just to do stuff um, in society, to do stuff. But... So, so the Morgan name's just kind of made up in my name. You guys just weird. heard it, um, liked it, chose it. <laughs> Yeah, because it's it's had a few stages as well. At one point, it was Morkina, which is like the, the Maori Morgan version of Morgan. <laughs> um, so that, but then it went back to Morgan again, and it's currently still Morgan. Uh, like my my mum, originally the surname apparently was Ruka. Okay. Uh, before Morgan, like that's like the actual blood surname before the Morgan change happened. Um. And apparently my mum has thought about changing it. You know, she thought about changing it back when she was younger, but just kind of kept it. And I've kept it for now as well. But yeah, it's just kind of like a semi, semi made up. I mean, it's still our family name now, but I mean, it doesn't really come from anywhere. It just came from necessity for surnames once, once the concept of surnames was introduced. That's, that's freaking, yeah, that's a lot of similarities um with Hawaii. So my name is Ikaika, is my first name. That's the Hawaiian word for like strength, strong, potency, stuff of that manner. But I feel like it's a modern Hawaiian name because like there isn't any historical accounts of Kanaka named Ikaika or right. any that I came across anyway. And yes. I even asked one of my kumu, like, hey, kumu is... Uh, was there any like famous wines named Ikaika back in the day? He's like, nope. 
I was just like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those interesting things, eh? Where it's like the, the words, like, because I would say Porowini as well, right? Like, Porowini, to me, if it's province, like, that's literally just the province. You yeah, know, the yeah. Maorified. But Turanga is an older word. An old like, word. Uh, and that word Maori. must be... Yeah, you know, yeah. we see that all over the place. And it's an interesting thing. Of course, one thing that's very popular in Maori names today is the Maori English name. So John, Hone. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. James, Hemi. Yeah. Like there's so many different Victoria, Wikitoria. Like there's, you know, we have all these different. Um, David versions. is that's Kavika, very... Exactly. Stuff Canales, like that. Stanley. Yes. So all those names, you know, it's like, it's, it's a real interesting concept too. Cause I kind of go, I don't really know how I feel about this. You know, yeah. like, if you want to give someone a Maori name, give them a Maori yeah, name. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not no if you want to call them John. Yeah. Just yeah. call them John. Yeah, that's funny. So I've pretty much took up about like two hours of your time, bro. And like, I Has really it been that appreciate it. I freaking, yeah, I can talk about this kind of shit for days, bro. If, Oh, it's great, eh? No, I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed it. Wow. You know, it's good when the time just sort of disappears on you. Oh, eh? hell yeah. One of the last... Sometimes people will talk for half an hour and you go, feels yeah. like it's been two hours. Bro, that's how I feel no. in school most of the time. It's like, <laughs> yeah. How does minutes feel like hours? Yeah. But um, wrapping up my pod, you're probably going to have a little different answer from most of my other guests because you're Maori. But... I like to ask everybody, what does aloha mean to you? Oh, yeah, interesting. Because obviously for us, we associate it with our word aroha. Yeah. Um, I mean, basically the same word, right? But just with an R. Yeah. Uh, but aroha, aroha for us is normally the word that we use to refer to compassion. Compassion, yeah, love. love. Love, compassion, you know, um, outwards that sort of positive energy that you would impart onto somebody. Um, and of course, you guys, though, have applied that terminology into greetings and thank yous, you know, where for us, I would say the equivalent word in use for us is kia ora. Yeah. You know, we've taken yeah. kia ora and we've turned it into the hello or the thank you, the, the aloha of, of Māori. But in terms of the actual root word, aroha, yeah, is definitely something love, we use right? to love and compassion um and just you know positive positive outward energy towards people um yeah yeah that, that's sort of where I, and so i would have placed the same association uh, and then of course you guys like i said have, have associated with greetings you know we would use it yeah. more like an actual context of saying like my care or compassion towards you yeah so my manao behind that is um yeah, so nowadays everybody likes to associate aloha with hello, goodbye. Yes. But we had words for that in Hawaiian. Yes. Like velina mai or ano ai. So my manao is that Hawaiians would just famously greet each other and farewell each other with love. You know? Yes. And exactly. It's like kia ora. You know, kia ora isn't technically hello or goodbye or thank you right uh kia ora means be healthy it means yeah, it literally good means life or to be well you yeah. know like to be of health and so when we say kia ora is that you're just wishing good health on somebody like oh thank you for this you know good health hope you hope you're well yeah well, hello hope sick. you're well you know like we've got words for hello and goodbye yeah. haere ra, kakite, you know all these words that we can use to actually just mean goodbye but of course that colloquial everyday use Kia ora, it applies in the same way that aloha does, uh, I think. And that's it. You're just wishing wellness against people uh, that you're interacting with, you know? Yeah, that is cool. Oh, before, a quick little side thing before I leave. Um, What do you guys say when you guys, um, after people sneeze? Like, what is your guys' equivalent to bless you? And also, what is what do you guys say when you, like, cheers drinks in Maori? Mama. Because in Hawaii, we say hola for both. So, like, when people sneeze, we say hola. And then when we cheers, we say hola. And it means life. Oh, yeah, right. Like, hola for yeah. us means life, right? But the, um, I don't know if we have one. Um, not in Maori that I know. Like, I've never heard anyone say anything in Maori if somebody sneezes. I've always just heard bless you, right? 
because of course maybe the concept of saying something is not something that we yeah, have right? like, yeah. if people sneeze you just sneeze um now in terms of cheersing you could go a few ways about it like maori definitely have um it's not necessarily something that i feel like more often than not people would just say cheers you know if, yeah. if anything yeah. but but if there was a close equivalent uh we have um the the phrase tihei modi order oh. which um is I, I i still don't know what the word that you would use to call this but it's it's almost also similar to what you might call our amen oh, like okay. it's one of those things that if someone is saying something they'll sign it off with tihei modi order and everybody yeah. else will say tihei yeah, modi order you know like it's one of those things and the tihei modi order refers to uh, funnily enough the sneeze of life oh. um so in the maori creation puraka again um Pane created the first woman out of clay and when yeah. he breathed life into her he breathed life in through her nose mm. and so she sneezed the first first breath <laughs> so to the maori creation story our first breath was the, a I sneeze see, yeah. and so tihei modi order is basically acknowledging our first breath of life right but oh. it was a sneeze a technically a sneeze so the sneeze of life always sounds quite funny to people because you go what the heck does that mean uh but literally it just means that the first breath we ever took as humans according to maori story was yeah. sneezing alive you know um and so that's what tihei modi order resembles so i would say if there's anything that was close to like a cheers or like a something you'd say in unison with people it would be tihei modi order oh super mean bro that's so cool well i really appreciate your time and your mana'o your ike your na'ao mahalo i had like such a good time bro and yeah, you really taught me a lot about different perspectives of the Pacific. And I hope we can stay in touch. And when you come visit my Mokupuni, you definitely got to come check out my Marae. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Thank you so much for having me. That was a good chat. And I mean, yeah, hell, if we have some more to talk about, we can always tee up another one and do round two if people want it. Because like you said, we could talk about this stuff for hours. Oh, bro. As people, we have. Yeah, as we have. People are definitely going to want it. So I'm probably going to get this chopped up and upload it onto Spotify and YouTube sooner than later. And then I'll share the Sweet. links and stuff. Yeah, and then I can share it around. That'd be me. Yup. Oh, and then um, I'm probably going to like do like clips of like just within the podcast if you're down to yeah 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 be yeah, yeah. A collaborator on instagram yeah absolutely yeah hell yeah i'll share those that's good content <laughs> but right on turanga i really appreciate it mahalo nui i can't say that enough and yeah i had a really much. good time brother yeah me too likewise it was nice to formally meet you and yeah ahui ho Thank you very much. Right. Kia ora, kia ora. <laughs> yes. Uh, shoots, bro.